Hey, my name is Alex and I'm the pastor of X Church. Thanks so much for taking time to listen or watch this talk today. I hope it encourages and inspires you on your journey of experiencing and extending God's love. If you like what you hear, you can go to xchurch.com and get more information about our church and ministry. And you can even donate to support what we're doing here in Baldwin and beyond. If you are local to the area, please join us in person for one of our X gatherings. We meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. in our storefront location we call the space located inside the Claymont Shopping Center. Thanks so much. Here's the message. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? I am excited to wrap this series up, bringing Holy back. But before I do, I'd like to take a detour. Can I do that for just a second? This will come up later in the talk, but I'd like to make a non-political statement about politics, if I may. I watched way too much news this week. Anybody else? Spiritual discipline. Turn it off. Um, My hope is that as we continue to ride out this pandemic and the issues of our day, that we would have a love for those who see things differently than we do. You were way too quiet just now, (laughs) but I've been watching what's been happening even in our county, and I'm disappointed on both sides of the aisle, and even those in the middle, and the comments that they're making about those who do not view what's going on the same way that they do, and it's unbecoming of Christians, and I'm guilty of it. So I'd like to, as your pastor, apologize, because I've probably made some comments in passing either to you or about maybe a politician or somebody that's making decisions right now in our nation that probably wasn't super uplifting, right? But we're all made in the image of God, right? And Jesus died for all of us, right? So let's live and act like it, okay? I'm preaching to Alex, so just so you know. All right, with that out of the way, I'm excited to wrap this thing up, as I said a moment ago, And we're talking about holiness, but we're not talking about being weird. We're not talking about rules, right? We're talking about living the way that Jesus wants us to live. Because Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it what? Abundantly, Abundantly, more, better than we could ever ask, think, or imagine, as it says in Ephesians chapter 3. And so we've been working from this position, ready? It'll be up on the screens. Holiness is a set-apart value that produces a set-apart visual which portrays a better way to live. What does that mean? It means it starts on the inside. What do I value? Because Jesus came to say, hey, wait a minute. What I want you to value is different than what the world values, those who do not know me, right? And then when we get that understanding in our hearts, it will change our visual or how we live. But so often when we talk about holiness, we work from the outside in instead, and that's just rules. And it's not getting to the heart of the matter. We're just treating symptoms at that point. And so my hope is that we understand the heart of this entire series. So as we talked about sexual purity and modesty, how we present our bodies in reaction to each other, and then also how we present them for the world. And then today, as we talk about something else, what goes in us? Okay, so today, part four is on sobriety. Sobriety. Now, a lot of things pop into your brain. When you hear the word sobriety, you probably think of alcohol or maybe drugs, right? And we're going to touch on that certainly, but sobriety in the Bible 
is so much more. But before we dive into what it is, you need to know something about your pastor if you don't already. I am 27 going on 72, okay? I am an old man at heart. I have people say to me, we should go do something, and they want to go do something that starts at 8 o'clock. <laughs> not this guy, right? That's bedtime, okay? Amen. I am not trying to do that. Um, I'm pretty sure it took me, like, what, three times to get through a movie we were watching the other day with friends, um, three different sittings, because I kept falling asleep. <laughs> because we were starting it too late. That's Alex. So I'm an old fart. I recognize that, okay? And, and so that's me, okay? I drink my coffee black, right? Um, I, I like it that way. And not only that, but I like my Bible in paper, you know? I, I know it's weird, but I like the paper one, okay? It reads different, you know? Preferably, you know, the old joke, the KJV, the way that Paul wrote it, right, you know? The way that Moses wrote it in KJV. So anyways, I digress. No, I read the ESV and the NLT, and we're going to unpack that together out of both translations today. But what is sobriety? Well, I want to turn our attention to a passage that we've actually been unpacking the last several weeks. Okay, so you've heard me quote it already, but we're going to read a little bit farther than we have thus far. So it's Romans chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 1 today. But then we're going to go all the way through verse 3. So here's what it says. It'll sound familiar to those who've been paying attention. And I know you all have, right? Right? Okay. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, right, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then it says this, For by the grace given to me, I say, to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think, watch this, with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So we've been talking a lot about holiness and how it's this daily, weekly, sometimes it's even hourly if I back it up a couple, surrendering to God, saying, okay, God, it's not my way, it's your way. What do you want? What do you have for me, right? Right? And then when we do that, it changes the way we think. And we unpacked that both in the purity conversation and in the modesty conversation. But today, notice as we keep reading, he says sober judgment. Well, how does sober judgment happen? I think we get sober judgment when we do the first two things, which is that we submit to God, we give him our bodies as a living sacrifice, and we seek not to conform to the patterns of this world because then we're able to properly view ourselves and each other. Make sense? And, and so what does that word sober mean? Well, it appears at least 10 times in the New Testament, okay? And almost every time, it, it, it means, it means um, controlled. That's one of the ways you could say it. Um, there are lots of different adjectives in English that we could use, but, 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 it, but it means to be controlled. Um, and, and so why is that important? Because I want to argue that biblical sobriety is more than just abstaining from a substance. Make sense? Not drinking, not smoking, fill in the blank, right? But rather, it's a, a, about being under the influence. Wait a minute. These are contradictory statements I'm making, right? No. Let me explain. Let's go to another passage in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. You ready? Here it is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Those two statements don't seem to go back to back. Am I right? Like they seem kind of random. Why would he place these two ideas, one about wine, one about the Spirit, next to each other? Here's why. When you get drunk, you come under the influence of whatever substance you're high or drunk on, right? You come under its influence. That's why when you get pulled over and you get arrested and you know where I'm going, right? Because 
you're under the influence. So then he says, be filled with the Spirit. See, that word filled there, it really means to be completed. And typically, throughout the New Testament, it's this idea that the Holy Spirit is in charge or is arresting you and is, is guiding you and is, and is empowering you. And, and so really, I think what Paul is trying to suggest is he does want us under the influence, but he doesn't want us under the influence of something, which is wine. He wants us under the influence of someone, the Spirit of God. Make sense? So I want to work from this idea today, this statement, again, up on the screens. I think that biblical sobriety is living under the influence of a someone, not a something. Because it's not just the absence of alcohol or drugs or food or porn or fill in the blank. We're going to talk about all of them. So even the Baptists aren't off the hook today, okay? But, come on, that was funny. Um, <laughs> but what we need to understand is that if we're going to be sober-minded, sometimes it can also mean alert, depending upon how it's translated into English. There are kind of two different words there for sober that are translated into sober, I should say. And, and, so, and, and so if we're going to be alert, if we're going to be biblically sober, it's not just about not drinking, not smoking, not overeating, etc. It's actually about coming under the influence of something better. And it's the spirit of God. Because here's what I do know. Here's what I do know. That, that some things, some substances can be blessings in moderation, right? And, and so today I've got two quick observations. There was a joke in there. It was the word quick, but we're going to try. <laughs> Sierra's back. She's calling me out. It's good. So, so um, there is an objector in the room, okay? And, and let me just say right now, I can poke fun at Baptists because I am one deep down inside somewhere, right? I grew up Baptist, okay? And, and so not all Baptists, but in my experience, many are what they call teetotalers, okay? Anybody know what that means in here? Okay, what's it mean? You don't drink, right? It means you don't drink. And so I kind of grew up believing that it was wrong to drink. So I'm talking about alcohol today because I think that this is important, okay, uh, before we talk about the other stuff. But I grew up believing, okay, that you could not drink alcohol. Did anybody else kind of understand that or believe that, right? So, so what I want to do today is I want to talk about this objection, but before I do, I want to wrap it under this first observation, which is this. What does it mean to come under the influence of a something? So that's the first observation today. What's it look like to come under the influence of a something? So that's the first point. That's what we're going to unpack today. But there's an objector who would say that this something, alcohol, is always off limits. And you know what? Um, I'm going to tell you something right now. I don't drink. I never have. I don't drink at all. I've never drank alcohol. Why am I telling you that? Because it's super important. Because it's going to kind of color my next set of observations. Here's what I mean by that. Um, I would love for many reasons, because of a personal conviction, to be able to tell you that, you know what, don't drink. But I can't do that. You know why I can't do that? Because I don't think that would make me a very faithful Bible teacher. Right? Because my job is not to come to this book with my belief systems and then find ways to make it support those. Right? But I've seen a lot of pastors and a lot of churches do that. Now, I'm not going to lie. I have biases. But that's a personal conviction for myself. And I'll explain why I have that in just a minute. But here's what I want to say to somebody who might be in the room today and say, okay, I can get on board with some other stuff, pastor, but alcohol, um, alcohol in every situation is wrong. I want to just walk through this because this is the one we often think of, right? When we talk about sobriety, we're going to get to the others in a minute. They'll have their moments, but I want to talk about this. First of all, the Old Testament, as I begin to study it actually positions alcohol as a gift in certain situations. Did you know that? So I want to read out of Deuteronomy chapter 14. Let's just unpack this together. This is 
um, Moses. It says, Now when the Lord your God blesses you with a good harvest, the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honored might be too far for you to bring your tithe. They were supposed to go and bring um, their tithe, their gift, their offering. If so, you may sell the tithe portion of your crops and herds, put the money in a pouch, and go to the place the Lord God has chosen. So again, these are rules, these are laws, instructions for God's chosen people, the Israelite people, right, in the Old Testament. So that's who God is talking to right now, okay? Um, That's what this rule is for. He says, then when you arrive, you may use the money to buy any kind of food you want, cattle, sheep, goats, wine, or other alcoholic drink. Now, in the ESV translation, it'll say wine or strong drink, okay? So strong drink is understood as an alcoholic beverage, okay? Then feast there in the presence of the Lord your God and celebrate with your household. Interesting. Okay, then we read in Psalm 104, 14 through 15, this. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. So I want to be clear. Drunkenness is a sin. It's inconsistent with God's plan for us. I just read it a moment ago. Be not drunk with wine right? Do not get drunk. It's debauchery. It's bad news because God doesn't want us under the influence of anything other than himself. And we're going to unpack why that is in a minute, okay? But I want you to understand that actually in moderation, alcohol can be a gift. Another objection might be, well, wine of biblical times had less, you know, wine had less alcohol in it, less ABV, less alcoholic content. That may very well be true, and there's a lot of science and scholars smarter than me who have traced this down and tried to prove this historically, but here's the point. Regardless, throughout Scripture, this point is rendered moot because over and over and over and over again, we are commanded not to be drunk with wine. So obviously the wine was still intoxicating, right? Also, I know that a lot of people will teach this out of tradition or conviction. And listen, I have a conviction that I personally don't drink. And again, I'm going to explain why in just a second. But we have to be very careful, myself included. And we even had to do this last week with the modesty conversation. I cannot, we cannot take our personal convictions and conflate them with God's commandments. Make sense? And so what happens is in the church, historically, we know that something is bad, right? So maybe we know that sexual promiscuity is bad. So we make a rule. You shouldn't dance because if you start dancing and bumping into each other, right? Bad things will happen. Babies will get made so we don't dance, right? Let's be honest. But scripture actually speaks about dancing unto the Lord. So that's not going to work for us, is it? The rule then gets placed on a pedestal and is then taught as though it's a command of scripture. And then we judge people based on that tradition. That is wrong. I just feel like I need to say that one more time. It's wrong. And you know what? Jesus condemns it. Let's look at Mark Here we go. These are the words of Jesus. Here's what he said in verse seven, excuse me, six of chapter seven. Jesus replied, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Who's he talking about? Who's he talking to? He's talking to the religious leaders of the day, the interpreter of that law, right? The law for the Israelite people. And here's what he says. He says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, and now he's quoting an Old Testament prophet. Here's what it says. 
These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Are you listening? How many times have we seen this happen? I know I have. Then he said, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. Listen, there's nothing wrong with tradition. Contrary to modern popular belief, okay? Tradition can be very good. But when we conflate tradition with commandment, conviction with commandment, and we start to teach our personal biases, okay, as from God's mouth, he says our worship is a farce. What? So we need to be careful that we don't do this. And then finally, it's really hard to argue that Jesus himself didn't drink. And as I began to study this over and over again, I think it's pretty clear. Jesus turned water into wine so that people could drink it, right? At the famous Last Supper that we always talk about, right? You see the paintings and things like that. Jesus refers to the cup as the fruit of the vine, right? But I want to turn to Luke chapter 7 because I think that this is the best example that illustrates this. Here's Jesus. Luke chapter 7, verses 31 through 35. To what can I compare the people of this generation? Jesus asked. How can I describe them? They are like children playing a game in the public square. They complain to their friends. We played wedding songs and you didn't dance. So we played funeral songs and you didn't weep. For John the Baptist didn't spend his time eating bread or drinking wine. So he's referring to John the Baptist, who was a famous figure in the New Testament, a prophet and relative of Jesus. He says he didn't drink wine. And do you say he was possessed by a demon? But the son of man, Jesus is talking about himself here. The son of man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks. And do you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners? But wisdom is shown to be right by the lives of those who follow it. So not only did Jesus drink, but he wasn't concerned about the optics. Now, listen, that doesn't mean that you can go do whatever you want with whoever you want. Jesus was never drunk because he lived a sinless life. Also, when he went into the houses of tax collectors and sinners and when he dined with them and when he hung out with them, he went there for a very specific purpose, right? Which was to show his love and to help save them. Make sense? So we need to keep that in check. But I just told you all the reasons why you don't have to not drink, but I'm also gonna say this. I think there are some watching online right now and there are some in this room that may need to make that decision for themselves. I've made it for myself. Here's why. Romans 13, 14. Ah, there it is again, right? I've also been talking about this verse a lot throughout this entire series. Do you guys remember what it says? Therefore, put on Christ Jesus the Lord and to make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That word provision there, it means to know in advance, to consider in advance, to create or facilitate an opportunity. There is alcoholism in my family. I have an addictive personality, all right? I have an addictive personality. I mean, right now, I'm going through this phase where, once again, I'm pretending to be an electric guitar player. But as you heard a moment ago, I'm not good at it. I really like it, but I'm not good at it. And I get really into it, and I watch all these YouTube videos, and right, I buy pedals and guitars. And a couple of you have made a joke about the fact that I have a new guitar every week. And it's fine, but I'm, you know, in that mode right now. If I find a new dessert that I really like or a new drink that I really like, okay, um, I'll get hooked on that substance, to use that language, okay? Um, 
For a while, I was reinvigorating my love of retro video games and was buying crap at Goodwill and on Facebook Marketplace. And my wife was trying to be supportive, but was like, how are we going to pay for this? And where are you going to put all of it? And any other wives relate? When I was a kid, I would go through phases. I remember loving Toy Story. I wore the VHS out. Some of you youngins don't even know. <laughs> Lucy has Disney Plus. She will never understand, right? She will never understand the magic of the VHS, okay? It's classic, all right? It is classic. So I would go through these phases. So I know I don't need another vice. I've got enough of them, right? I love food. We're going to talk about that later. We're coming for you. I know. I know. I don't need another vice. So I said, you know what? I know myself. I know my tendencies. I know it runs in my family. So I'm not going to take a drink, and I never have, and I don't plan to. And I believe that's a conviction, and I believe that in Romans chapter 14, it says that, hey, If you don't think it's right for you to do it, you shouldn't do it. I believe it would be wrong for me to do it right now in this season that God has me in. That's a conviction of mine. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's extreme. I thought it was a gift. Yes, it is. But also, what does Jesus say? Hey, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Hand, cut it off. Why does he say that? That seems really strong. He's saying sometimes in the pursuit of holiness, We have to take drastic measures. I have another family member who also on the same side of our family, they, um, there's alcohol on that side of our family. And so they do drink, but they have very specific rules. In other words, they only have so many within certain amounts of time frame in certain settings. Okay. And, And I commend that. And that's, that's a great example of how in moderation, Things like alcohol can be a blessing. And so we've chosen to tackle that differently, but we both know this runs in our family, okay? And we don't need that, right? And so I think that today I can't teach that everybody should abstain because I actually think that there are some, some benefits to drinking alcohol. I can't believe I'm saying that, but I think that there's a, there's a, there's a celebratory component. Um, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to, to, to drink wine for medicinal purposes, Okay, to settle his stomach, it says. Um, But I think more of us need to consider whether or not our relationship with alcohol is consistent with our holiness and say, does this get me in trouble more often than it doesn't? Am I making sense? And that's not legalism. I do believe that that's a biblical framework in scripture which says, hey, wait a minute. Just because I can doesn't mean I should. What's it say in 1 Corinthians 6, 12? You say I can do anything, but not everything is beneficial for you as an individual. So I wanted to get that out of the way up front. Okay, that, that's why I don't personally drink, but it's not just about drinking now, is it? So what I want to do today is I want to talk about the side effects, okay? The side effects of coming under the influence of a something instead of a someone. Because again, we've said this from the beginning, holiness is not about rules and it's not about God ruining your fun, right? It's not about ruining your fun. It's actually about keeping you from making really bad decisions that can ruin your life, A, or really B, because A is that he just wants you to fill your time doing better stuff. How about that? Even I fall into that mindset of, Maybe if I can scare people, right? I think that that's a lot of this too. Can I be honest? This isn't in the notes, but I think a lot of pastors, a lot of teachers, well, meaning, just like in the modesty conversation we had last week or the purity one two weeks before, there's a lot of scaring that happens instead of just teaching that Jesus is better. Does that make sense? Did that hit home at all? But there are some negatives. The first side effect is that you can become impaired, You can become impaired, and that's what drunkenness is, right? When you come under the influence of something, you're impaired. Look at what it says in Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine produces mockers. Alcohol leads to brawls. Those led astray by drink cannot be wise. 
It can lead you astray. It can impair your judgment, your ability to reason and to think the way that God wants you to think. It can get you into trouble. In Romans 13, 13, going to the New Testament now, it says this, because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see, right? That's our set apart visual, right? The result of our different values we have as Christians. Don't participate in the darkness of wild parties and drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and immoral living or in quarreling and jealousy. Notice that wild parties and drunkenness are next to words like quarreling and jealousy because, again, we like to rate sins, don't we? That one's worse than this one. We're going to get on to that in just a minute. But even jealousy is a dangerous behavior, right? Jealousy can impair your ability to make wise decisions too. Just watch like Law and Order or CSI, right? It happens all the time. And I think part of this is because God is up there, here, everywhere, looking at the whole picture from start to finish. And never once, I don't think, did he ever witness or see somebody leave a wild party and go, I made really good decisions last night. <laughs> you know, like, I, I have more self-respect than I ever have, okay? I know that those people have a really high view and opinion of me now after all that last night. I did what? <laughs> oh, wait, no, that was somebody else. No, that was me. Okay, that explains why my head hurts. Okay, right, like so on and so forth. Yes, right? God is trying to say, hey, I see the whole thing. I know you because I made you, and maybe there's a better way. Does it make sense? It's not about ruining your fun. It's about a better way to live. It's about a better way to live. Now, I just said a moment ago, I don't want to scare you, but I think that these statistics, these statements do help when we're talking about alcohol, and then we're going to move on to some other things here. But here's what I read this week in my study. It's from the National Institute of Alcoholic Abuse and alcoholism. An estimated 95,000 people, approximately 68,000 men and 27,000 women, die from alcohol-related causes annually, making alcohol the third leading preventable cause of death in the United States. That's pretty wild, right? This one got me from World Health Organization. 55% of domestic abuse predators were drinking alcohol prior to assault. Because it impairs you. Right? Am I making sense? And so, Jesus is saying, there's a better way. There's an abundant way. There's a holy way. I don't want to ruin your fun. I've given you these things to enjoy in moderation. But when you abuse them and you come under the influence of a something instead of a someone, we're going to have some problems. Drugs. I want to talk about marijuana for a second. Because you know me, I love to be controversial, don't I? No, um, sometimes I ask myself as I'm prepping these notes, Alex, why do you do this to yourself? Like, just don't, man. It's like a sickness, but I think I need to, okay? Because there's a big conversation happening amongst church leaders and in the church right now about what happens when marijuana is legalized more broadly. And it is, by the way, in case you aren't paying attention. Right? And I hear this case made, especially a young, excuse me, especially among um, younger people, millennials, Gen Z, um, because there is an anxiety pandemic. There's a depression pandemic. And the problem is that this is often used as an excuse or it's used as a reason for why 
marijuana needs to be legalized because it can help cope with these anxious feelings, thoughts, actions, so on and so forth. Right? But I want to say this. That's a Band-Aid. It's a Band-Aid. And for those of you who struggle with anxiety on a daily world level, how am I trying to say this? I'll put it in two categories. There's anxiety and then there's anxieties. I've said this before. Um, for those who struggle with the anxieties of life and they feel more compounded, that might be because of some decisions that you're choosing to make as an individual, and those are things that are inside of your control. And the first thing I would say is you need Jesus if you don't have Jesus because he's the one who keeps you in perfect peace. But I would also say for those of you who struggle with a more clinical mental illness, which is real and we need to talk about, God has gifted brilliant minds and doctors with the ability to help you as well, right? And there are medications and treatments for you as well. Am I making sense? And they're both important. This is not the answer, I don't think. And I think the research shows that. And I want to read this. This is from um, Kevin J. Van Hooser, who's the professor of systematic theology at Trinity Evangelical School. And he's commenting from a theological perspective, but he's also quoting some, um, some science uh, journals and some, some things like that. So I want to read this. I thought it summed it up well. He said, regarding the short and long-term effects of marijuana on the brain, one of the best resources is the National Institute on Drug Abuse page for marijuana, which concludes, watch this, that frequent users of large amounts of marijuana are more likely to have lower life satisfaction, poorer mental and physical health, and greater relationship problems. So what's interesting is that studies show that those who try to use this as a Band-Aid end up compounding the problems, okay, that drove them to use it in the first place. Am I making sense? The American Academy of Pediatrics states that marijuana use in teens and young adults result, results in, quote, impaired short-term memory and deceased concentration, attention span, and problem solving. Alterations in motor control, coordination, judgment, reaction time, and tracking ability have also been documented. And then later in his discourse, he says this, note the difference between drinking alcohol and smoking pot. A glass of wine complements food, but doesn't result in intoxication. Not necessarily, right? Whereas the whole point of consuming cannabis for recreational purposes is to get high. Now, I did look this up. You can microdose and try not to get high, okay? And there can be benefits to that. I'm not a doctor. I'm not here to comment. But what I am here to say is this. Anything that we come under the influence of that is not the spirit is not consistent with what God wants for you because he wants you to live a better life, a more abundant life, and that's a Band-Aid. So I want us to keep that in perspective. The second side effect is that it will not only leave you impaired, but it can cause you to become imprisoned. Imprisoned. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 8. He says this, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And maybe you've heard me talk about this before, but addiction often is tied to slavery to sin. Okay? Okay? And so what he's saying is sin is really engaging and exciting and enticing, but you need more, 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 because it doesn't satisfy you. It doesn't get the job done. Again, it's a Band-Aid, right? A Band-Aid with side effects that are negative. He says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, ah, I love that. You'll be free indeed, right? I love this. Psalm 16, 4. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall 
multiply. In other words, when we run after other things, our sorrow, okay, increases. That's consistent with what we just read about marijuana. These problems that we are trying to mask get worse, right? But there are other things that are also imprisoning besides alcohol and drugs. And do you know what a big one is? Food. Here we go, buckle up. Food. I want to read this in Proverbs. Proverbs 23, verses 20 through 21. We're going to start there. But not, be not, excuse me, among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat. Okay, time out for just a second. Gluttony is overeating, right? That's what it means. I want you to notice here that the wisest guy on the face of the planet, King Solomon, is writing a book of wisdom, okay? And he lumps the drunkard and the glutton into the same category. Right? Right next to each other. Be not among drunkards or among gluttonous eaters of meat, for the drunkard and the glutton will come to poverty, and slumber will clothe them with rags. What's he saying? They're both going to end up in the same place. And I know what you're thinking. My eating problem does not affect other people the way that my grandfather's or my brother's or my mom's drinking problem affected other people. You might be right, but that means nothing. And it's irrelevant. Why? Because Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, when he's talking about sexual purity, remember this, and you're wondering how does it tie in? He says, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her. And so what he's saying is, it's all the same. And you might say, but me looking at a woman and lusting and me going out and having an affair have to be different. The consequences are different, but in the sight of God, they're both egregious. And so the same goes for gluttony. And what I have seen, I read it this week in a book, by a well-meaning pastor. I have seen people try to, we need to recognize that there's a difference. I've talked about this with one of our elders. There is a difference. We need to recognize that there are differences in overeating and overdrinking. However, when we use that as an excuse, right, to try to justify our overindulgence with the substance of food, We've totally missed it. That's where we can't do it. Am I making sense? Because it's wrong. It's wrong. I have struggled with my weight most of my life. Okay? I've never been classically fit or in shape. I've always loved food, and I'm short and stocky, and somebody mentioned the word husky earlier, and it's true. Like, I had to shop in the husky section. Um, there was a whole episode of the show Arthur. Anybody remember that? Where Arthur had to shop in the husky section, and I was like, yes, I feel this, right? Um, that was me. I was husky, okay? Um, I was curvy. It's fine. I'm fine with it. Um, now... After counseling. No, it's fine. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I'm still working through this though, right? And um, there have been times in my life where I've been heavier and then I've been lighter. Now, it's not about weight. That's not what I'm here to talk about. Okay? We're all built differently. We need to recognize that. We're all built differently. We have different shapes. Not everybody's going to look like everybody else. Okay? That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? But for me, when I went to college, okay, and I was alone, and my mom wasn't there anymore, right? What I did not do is I didn't go party. I didn't go get drunk. I didn't go smoke pot. I went to Taco Bell, y'all, right? Listen, 
Here's the thing. I went to a Bible college, okay? So we had a dry campus anyways, and you weren't supposed to drink. And I was like a big time rule follower, so that was not going to happen because there were parties off campus, right? You're not going to stop those kids from doing what they want to do. But I developed a different vice, okay? Because as you know, it's the middle of the night and, you know, it's one o'clock and you're working on that theology paper. This should make you feel good about my preaching, okay? That theology paper you've known about for about three months, okay? And you're supposed to dissect a parable and explain what Jesus is talking about and all that jazz. And it's due at 8 a.m., You've known about it for three months, but you started it at 8 p.m. to get a jump start, right? The night before. I got a B. I'm not, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying get Bs get degrees. And all the parents got real mad. Get him off the stage. But it's true. And it's like 1 o'clock. And me and my roommate, we would go to Taco Bell, right? And we'd load up. And I'm, I'm sure they had to have known our order. Because I mean every day. So this was, a, you know, so you're starting at 8. You know, you're, you're taking a little break at 1 a.m. You're grabbing your beefy five-layer burrito and your cinnamon twists and your Baja Blast, praise the lamb. And, you know, you're, you're chowing down. And then that only gives you about an hour of, like, juice. Because after an hour, Taco Bell let, starts letting you down, okay? You know? So then... So then you take your books into the restroom and you, you sit in the restroom for a couple hours and you finish, just me? Okay. And then you go to bed for about two hours. Anybody else relating to this? And then you get up and, and if you're me, like I, I'm like, I have to shower every day. I'm just like, I have to do that. It's just a thing. So you're getting up, so you're getting like, and then you're in the shower and then you got gas because you're BB five layer burrito and it's a whole mess and it's a whole thing. And then you're running to class and anyways, I, that, that last part was just for free. But the point is that I had this problem, okay? My regular order at McDonald's was a 10-piece chicken McNugget, a large fry, two McDoubles, and a large root beer. And I could, I could have eaten more. Like, that was me being, like, self-controlled. Could have eaten more. The freshman 15 came and went in about the first month. Or not went, I guess it stayed. And then I kept going. I remember getting on the, the scale when I got home for Christmas break, and I was like, oh, no, this is not good, right? And I began a journey of changing my, and I, God convicted me. Food is an idol. It's imprisoned you. you, you when you're sad, you eat. When you're happy, you eat. When you're mad, you eat. Somebody needs to hear this today. It's easy to, to judge the person that partakes. I, I'm just going to speak from my personal experience. There, I'm just going to say it this way and let, let the Holy Spirit do what he wants with this, okay? I have been in seasons of life where I have been overweight because of my own choices. That's what we're talking about. Just to be clear, my own personal choices. I've lived overweight because I have chosen to not take care of myself and overeat on a regular basis. And then I have judged other people for partaking in alcohol in moderation. Only one of us was being disobedient to God. It was me. Okay? It was me. Last fall, had some rough stuff happened. I'm not going to get into it. And I began coping again with my mistress ice cream. Okay, let me just tell you. Okay. And I had put on about 15 pounds from about middle of October till Christmas. Some of that was just, I mean, Christmas. I mean, that's a hard, that's a hard time. You know what I mean? Like, did you ever watch The Biggest Loser? And then, like, they'd come on during the commercials and be like, here's how you can make your, your family's healthy Thanksgiving. Dad, you know, have you ever seen that? The, the Jenny O commercials where they're like, here's how you can make a turkey. No, that's not what Jesus meant when he was talking about gluttony. I think that there's a, there's a Thanksgiving clause in there somewhere. 
Um, I feel like there should be, but the point is, the point is, I found myself, and so again, I have to get back. So, so for those of you who know me, uh, I try to work out. I, I try. To, I watch what I eat. Um, I have a. I have what I call my fighting weight. I try to be at. It's my. It's my. It's my. I don't. I always say I'm not trying to be. I said. I always say, I'm not trying to be skinny, but I'm not trying to be chubby. I'm just trying to be happy. And somewhere in the middle, I kind of just kind of dance between the two. <laughs> Anybody? Am I the only? <laughs> just some days I'm feeling a little more chubby. Some days I'm feeling a little more skinny. It just depends. That's how we roll, okay? But the point is, we all have vices. For a while there, my vice became exercise, something that was really good. And I found myself over-exercising. And if I didn't exercise twice in one day, then I felt like I wasn't doing it right. I've talked a lot about this, but it's amazing the studies they've done about what pornography does to your brain. We're all imprisoned, or we have been imprisoned at different times in our lives. Maybe it's not alcohol, maybe it's not weed, maybe it's not hard drugs, but maybe it's something. Video games are awesome, right? But if they're taking away time spent with your wife or your children, maybe you need to reevaluate. Idolatry, that's what we're talking about. Putting something in God's place, it imprisons you. So I want to leave you with this thought as we wrap up the first observation today. Using a substance to cope compromises your hope. One more time. When we use a substance to cope, we compromise our hope. Look at what it says in Jonah. I love this. You've heard me quote it before, I'm sure. It's Jonah 2.8. Those who pay regard to vain idols, food, television, alcohol, fill in the blank. They forsake their hope of steadfast love. If you want steadfast love, love that shows up every time and never, ever lets you down, stop using those substances to cope. Am I making sense? Because there's a better way. Second observation, which I promise will go much quicker today. Ready? It's not about coming under the influence of a something but a someone. Have you ever come under the influence of a someone, a person in your life? I had a friend growing up. His older brother was so cool, I thought, at the time. And he was always daring me to do stuff. And anything that he said, I would do. Just straight up, okay? He always got me hurt. Um, he always got me in trouble. Um, he usually ended up laughing at me because he couldn't believe I actually did the thing that he bribed me to do, but I still did it because I just thought he was so cool. Anybody else? Just me? That's not what we're talking about here, right? What we're talking about is the Holy Spirit. Here's what it says in Ephesians 4. Excuse me, that's not true. It's Ephesians 1. It says this, in him you also, when you heard the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. When you put your faith in Jesus, he comes his spirit comes and lives inside of you. Can we talk about that for a second? So if you're here today and you're like, I believe in Jesus, his spirit lives in you and helps you do all kinds of incredible, amazing things. Sometimes he helps you just be a decent person and not rip anybody's head off. Anybody else? I don't know. Like when I see nice people that don't know Jesus, I'm like, I don't know how you're doing that because without Jesus... Not so nice. Anybody else? Just me? That's fine. But, but here's what we read in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. We call this the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, this is what it looks like when you're living the way that Jesus empowers you to live. Again, the better way. Here are the things that you're capable of. Are you ready? I want you to think about this. Here's what you are capable, it says, of love. A love that loves people even when they seem unlovable, okay? Um, joy, even when things around you are sad. 
peace, even when things around you are hard. Patience. Patience even... Patience. Who needs more patience? Just me. When you're parenting a three-year-old. Okay? Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Not giving up. Gentleness. Self-control. Against such things there is no law. You are capable of all those things. You are capable of all of those things. It says in Philippians 2.13, For God is working in you, and he gives you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Did you know that? But how, do, how, does, this, how does this happen? Well, the, the first thing is that he's, he's, he's imparting something to you. He'll impart wisdom. So that's, that's the, that's, I, want, I, want to, I want to put that up on the screen here today. He'll impart some wisdom. He'll, he'll, he'll teach you. Here's what, here's what Jesus says. Here's what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Then later he says, these things I've spoken to you while I'm with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he's going to teach you all the things, or teach you all things, and to bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you, right? So when you're trying to walk through 2021, okay, because so far it's like marginally better than 2020, right? Like if we're just being honest, okay? Um, the Holy Spirit is in you and can remind you of how Jesus wants you to live. Isn't that cool? And we always say this, right? Um, he said, he'll remind you of all the things that I said. Well, how do I know what he says? Well, I gotta read it, right? So as you're in the Bible and as you're reading, he's speaking and he, listen, there are people that don't have the Bible that have the Holy Spirit, Okay? Um, and the Spirit can, can give you wisdom in a situation, can help you in a, in a season, can help you through stuff, can give you that wisdom to know, how do I approach this person in this scenario? We don't talk about that part of the Holy Spirit a ton, right? But this is the difference between coming under the influence of the Spirit and coming under the influence of a substance or a someone. Am I making any sense? How do, how do we do that, though? Well, it's a daily thing. It goes back to Romans chapter 12. Therefore, by the mercies of God, present your bodies every day. Okay, okay, God, help me today. Holy Spirit, help me love my coworker. Help me have peace today when I go to the DMV um, or, or maybe some gentleness so I don't lose my cool when they tell me that I don't have some other obscure, obscure form of ID that I didn't know that I needed. You know what I'm talking about? Um, help me with this. Help me as I'm watching the news and I'm trying to make sense of what's going on. Give me wisdom. Help me. Help me. He's going to impart some wisdom. The final thing is um, the side effects of, uh, uh, of coming under the influence of a someone is that your life is going to be improved because of those fruits that I just read a moment ago, or that fruit, I should say. Your life is improved. Because let me just tell you something. Um, prior to being called to be a pastor and like really believing that God was calling me to, to lead a church, um, you would not have, you would not have, if you knew Alex, you would not have said that he was like somebody who like looked out for other people, really. Like not saying that I was a bad guy, but what I mean is like, I was like, empathy was not my thing. Like it wasn't, like my mom goes, so true. That's nice. Yeah, thanks mom. Like I wasn't, I just, you know, I was like, you do you, whatever. Like if you're wrong, you're wrong. I was very like, if you're wrong, tough nugs, man. You know, I never once, not, I should say once, but I, rarely if I was in a debate and I knew I was right about something, your feelings almost never came into view for me. If I'm just being, maybe you struggle with that. Maybe you struggle with that. And as God began to, 
called me to be a pastor. He began to shift in me. The Holy Spirit began to help me. Hey, you have a spirit of love and of gentleness. And you have an ability to now empathize with people. And it was amazing. It was like, I want, I, I'm, I've been on this journey of like, for the longest time, like I didn't know what it meant to like hurt with people. I'm just being, can I just be real? Like I didn't really understand like, they're hurting, so I'm hurting. Like, that was kind of a foreign concept to me. I know you're like, wow, what a terrible person you used to be. Like, right? But like, okay. And God began to shift my perspective. And, and so today, what I want to encourage you with is this is what happens when you come under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Because this week, as I said at the beginning, God's been convicting me. Because I've been watching the news and I've been listening to politicians and people on either side of the aisle and, and, and scientists and doctors and business owners and how do we approach COVID and how do we approach this pandemic and what does the fall look like? And I'm gonna be honest, I've been very disheartened. Anybody else? Frustrated, angry. And I found myself back in that place of, I don't understand how somebody could see it that other way. Can I just be honest? And it's easy to, 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 to vilify people that don't see it the way you see it, which is why I'm bringing this full circle today. And I said, but God, I have the spirit. So Holy Spirit, I need you to help me to love people and believe the best about them, even though I may totally disagree with them. Because contrary to what you might think, there are people that are doing things that you might disagree with, but maybe for some of them, their motives are pure, okay? And but there are also some that maybe their, their motives aren't pure. Let's be honest. And we need to take a stand against that, all right? But God, help me to see them the way that you see them because it says that the Holy Spirit helps me to love, so I've been praying that every day. God, help me to love people. Help me to lead, I'm praying in humility. Every day I pray those two things. Help me to love people. Help me to lead with humility because I don't, I don't know. People ask me like, what do you think? I, don't, I got my opinions, I got some ideas, but what I'm realizing more and more is I really just don't know. It doesn't mean that I'm not taking stances. It doesn't mean that I don't, am I making sense? But I wanna read this um, as, we, as we wrap up today. And I think it's super important. Um, if we just go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and as we wrap this entire series, one of the hallmarks of our holiness, what makes us set apart, is our love. Because Jesus said to his disciples, by this they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Am I making sense? That's how they're gonna know. That's how they're gonna know. Love is patient and kind. I know you've heard it before, but that's okay. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. That's holiness, right? That's holiness. I want to say this, allowing the spirit to teach will transform your reach. When you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you and say, teach me Holy Spirit, teach me God, help me to see this the way that you see this, help me to love the way that you love, help me to have self-control in this situation, help me to be gentle with this person that I disagree with. Help me to have peace in the midst of all these crazy headlines. Help me to fill in the blank, right? That's what it's all about, full circle. Coming under the influence of a someone, the conqueror, Jesus, not a something. Because those are just Band-Aids. They leave you wanting more, but Jesus satisfies. That's what holiness is all about. And really, my hope is that as we wrap this series today, you know, Jesus, he wants to, he wants to blow your mind. He does. Will you let him? Will you give yourself fully to him? 
today we're going to celebrate baptism. Did you know that? You probably wondered what the pool was for as you came into the space today. And um, Jade expressly shared with us that she did not want it to be a big thing. And being her friend, she should know better. I, of course, it's a big thing. Okay, like, it's a big thing. But Matt and Jade are getting baptized today. And I got to just, they're going to be so mad at me. But um, it's really cool because, you know, Matt and I, we grew up together, right? And so it's cool that now he's at this place where he's like, you know, um, now that I'm an adult, you know, I, 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 I see things differently. I look at how God is, has brought me to this place. And, you know, you've said, I want to I do this as an adult now, you know, and I want to I wanna make this, this declaration that, that I believe Jesus is better. That's really what you guys are doing today. That's what baptism is, in case you didn't know. It's an outward expression of what has happened in your heart, which is that Jesus is better. And it was really cool talking to Jade, and I'm putting her on the spot here. Um, and she may kill me later, and that's fine. Um, but one of the things that we talked about with Jade was, you know, and maybe you felt this way before, and I've taught on this, but Jade goes, you know, I can't pinpoint that moment where I walked an aisle or I raised my hand or I got saved in the traditional sense. And that's many of us. That's, that's not just her in this room, Right. But she goes, but, but I know that Jesus is my Lord. I, I, I want to serve him and I believe in him. And so today is the culmination of God chasing her, I believe, and, and, her, and her coming into that relationship with Jesus and now saying, I'm all in. I believe you're better, right? And so like for me, it's super cool because there's some of my dearest friends that, that we get to baptize them together and celebrate that as a church family. Isn't that pretty cool? Because that, that is part of this holiness process. It's saying, okay, Jesus, I believe you're better. You've saved me from those things. And you saved me to something new, something abundant. So we're gonna live pure. We're gonna present our bodies in a way that honors those around us and we're gonna live sober-minded, coming under the influence, not of things, okay, but, but him. You with me, church? And it's an everyday decision. Jesus, I need you. That's it. That prayer every morning, I've said it before, I'll say it again, change your life. So let's pray, and then we'll make our way outside, and we'll get to Duncan. Sound good? Let's do it. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your goodness. I pray that you would change our value system, that you would help us to, Father, value the things that you value and want the things that you want so that that may produce in us a visual for the world to see, wow, there's a better way, a more abundant way to live, God. And that that way of living would, would make itself most apparent in the way that we love people because this world so desperate need, desperately needs to know your love. Lord, we thank you for Matt and Jade and the decision that they've made today to, to take their faith even more public and to say, we believe that Jesus is better, God. And we ask that you bless them in this today. We love you and pray all this in your name. Amen. Hope you've experienced God's love. Now go and extend it after the baptism, and I'll see you outside. Thanks.